Hi. It's Tash and Carly. And you're listening to Motherhood. Not as we planned. So get comfy, grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine and let's start talking about all the things too many of us avoid discussing. Hi guys and welcome back to another episode of Motherhood Not As We Planned. So we are putting a trigger warning on this episode just for anyone that may find it a bit triggering talking about any type of postnatal depression or traumatic birth traumatic births um so this episode we kind of wanted to delve back and start right at the beginning like when we became mums and kind of talking about those first new weeks of being a mum and how that changes you as a person and how that also maybe has an effect on your relationship with your partner and um that's sort of what we wanted to discuss um I feel like there's definitely topics within this that aren't spoken about enough. Mm. It's that taboo of maybe not necessarily feeling all that joy and happiness after having a baby. Yeah. I know for me that I was so desperate to become a mum and it took a lot longer than I had hoped. So when I then had Blake and Ivy and didn't, feel that constant joy I was a bit like this is really weird but Mm. for me I found that come day three I think it was when my milk came in the hormones and the emotions that just hit me I just suddenly felt this like overwhelming like feeling of like shit what have I done like this is my life now and it's so hard to explain how I felt because I loved them and I was happy but I just couldn't help but always cry and I wish that someone told me that that was normal Mm. and now rightly or wrongly when people I know that I'm friends with are having a baby I do just give them that sort of like warning of afterwards you might feel really overwhelmed and have this like mixed emotions of like happiness and sadness and that's really normal and it's okay I cried for weeks literally it hit five o'clock every day and I would just cry and I think it was a mixture of just feeling overwhelmed in that uncertainty of what the evening was going to bring it was all completely new to you yeah and having that responsibility of these little people and it's all on you and you no longer th- have to think about yourself it's just all on these children and it also does have a massive impact on your relationship as well just generally the whole dynamic of your home changes, it really changes yeah um so I found that really hard and I just think it's not something that we should be ashamed of talking about. You know, you see all these mums and how like they're in their lovely newborn bubble and they're really happy, but I think the reality of it is is you can struggle and still love your baby and still be happy and it's really normal to feel those feelings. Did you have anything like that? So I I didn't actually experience that in either of mine. Um but I did suffer suffer with birth trauma. Um, and, and again, I felt like this wasn't something that was ever spoken about. I think I went into the whole idea of birth really, really naively. I was really, really fit and active. Like I was working out till 39 weeks pregnant. I was, I'd done hypno, uh, hypnobirthing, like my baby was going to come out in the water, swim out into this beautiful world. It's going to be beautiful and blissful and like all that crap. And it could not have been more opposite. So I, I was in labour for a good few days. Um, I, my waters went. I ended up being put on the, um, uh, it being induced and I was on the drip. And just a little bit of a heads up for anyone who is does get put on the induction drip. Like, please, for my opinion, but consider um, an epidural beforehand because it literally went from like zero to fuck my life in... It was just, it was the most painful thing I've ever experienced. Um, anyway, that like went on. The epidural made it manageable. And I was like, okay, we can do this. It's fine. Like we can do this. Doesn't matter if I've had to have pain relief, whatever. And then during a, what's it called? Like a check as to how dilated I was. She was like, um, I think I've just put my fingers up your baby's bottom. I was like, sorry, what? So he was breached the entire time, which is why it wasn't really progressing. And we were like reaching the point where, you know, if your waters go, you've got to 
have had the baby out by mm-hmm. X amount of time because of infection. So, yeah, I got rushed to theatre for a C-section. And, yeah, I I had a really traumatic birth. Um, bas- basically, when they pulled him out, he wasn't breathing. And just suddenly, like, the whole atmosphere changed. Like, the buzzers when everyone was, like, running around... And I was just laying there, cut open the table, and I just remember seeing, like, this little lifeless body over on the side, all these doctors around them trying to resuscitate. And my ex was over there. And... Yeah, I didn't... I didn't know if he was alive. Um... Um, no one could tell me. They they didn't know, you know. They were the next thing I knew, they were all gone. They were all out the room. They'd taken him. They'd taken my ex with him. I remember just laying there and just being like, I don't know if my baby's alive or and like no one could tell me anything. The midwife who was with me called my mum. My mum actually got a speeding ticket coming to find me. Um, and yeah. It was a few hours until I found out if he was like if he was going to be okay, and um, I eventually got wheeled up to go and see him. It was, it took a while because like I ended up getting a temperature. I think like the stress of it all and everything couldn't get my temperature down. It was boiling hot, and eventually I got to like touch him through the incubator. Um, I didn't get to hold him till the next day and I just just nothing can prepare you for that and I think and as well since it's happened to me I've spoke to so many women who have gone through similar or have had a really traumatic birth in some way and I just felt afterwards this enormous like feeling of being let down by my body I felt like I'm a woman like this is what we're designed for how have I not been able to do it and I I can't explain it I was like at war with myself I was so angry at myself for not being able to um um sorry it's like one of the first times I've spoken about this on a long time one thing I will say is um I I did did have therapy for this um I, I got to the point where it's it was consuming me quite a lot um like just, even things I didn't know would trigger it would trigger it and yeah I, I kind of knew it I needed to address it I, I did therapy with this amazing lady it's kind of a bit of an alternative therapy it might not be for everyone but if you want to follow her on Instagram it is at this therapy works she was incredible and like without her I 100% wouldn't have gone on to have another baby it's she like the fact that I can even talk about this and not be on the floor yeah. talking about it I never even was able to speak about it but good for you for like noticing that you needed help and actually seeking it I put all this pressure on my birth plan like I was that person who had written this birth plan like do not ask me if I want pain relief. It makes me shudder thinking about all the things. But again, would I have listened if someone had said it? I don't know. But again, so after everything I went through, it was kind of my mission to get talking about stuff like this because you've. it's like with what we were saying, even with our separation, it's all these taboo things, things where you feel big feelings or feel certain ways we make it we don't speak about it but really it's so normal like yeah. the amount of people I know who have had a really traumatic birth probably outweighs those who have had a really positive birth from being completely honest mm-hmm. and I just think we need to speak about it man. yeah I mean like you said you felt at one point like you really like took it out on yourself and felt like your body like let you down it's probably things like that that make us not talk about it because we're almost like ashamed of it yeah that's probably why people don't talk about like having a bad marriage or because 
it's almost looked on like it's like shame on you like you fail yeah but like at the end of the day like things don't run smoothly like my birth with Blake and Ivy you know I went into labor six weeks early I didn't meet Blake till the day after he got taken straight away into NICU into an incubator on a breathing monitor didn't meet Ivy till a few hours later like obviously anyone's idea was being past their baby having that moment having that skin to skin and it fucking sucks when you don't get it but I think the reality is thank god as long as your baby is a healthy yeah. like i'd love a water birth i like the idea of it you see it do you know what else it is it's like seeing it in films yeah yeah they, they just might oh go if they like their waters break at home and then they just quickly go to hospital and they have a few pushes and then they're holding their baby and then they go home so do you think as well like the pressure of what we do like i can't quite remember but i think you didn't share much of your journey till after you had the kids but I remember I shared quite, I was very open after the birth. I thought, I need to share this. I need to share this to normalize it. And I'd share like my walks up to see Theo. And I remember this one comment I got about the kind of birth I had and Theo's weight because he was only Diddy and saying how like this is all my fault because I was exercising and I cared more about my appearance and like you deserve to have like an unhealthy baby. And obviously rational brain like i know that's not true but when you are in that heightened emotion i mean what day, disgusting power i remember literally i cannot explain how low i felt like because i was already beating myself up but i just think yeah it's it's so hard in those early days because your hormones are so responsible for everything else and mm-hmm. you know meeting a baby for the first time like I know I did when I first met the R. I got I did get that euphoric love for him, but that isn't always the case for people. I know people who didn't get that, and I think we kind of need to just normalise. Oh, that's the yeah, and that's it's not okay, and it is so common. Like I remember, I think my friend like found it really hard to connect with her baby, and you get this like massive guilt, and it's like that start of mum guilt, isn't it? That's that you know, I just feel like also it's not spoken about. You you suddenly go home with this newborn baby and you're just left to just like be responsible. And it's like you're at school and you learn all this crap that you never use ever again. Algebra and sin. <laughs> sin tan. Yeah. What, what, what even is that? I know. Like, I mean, I did do child development, Maybe. but oh yes, you know, a storm. <laughs> But I just feel like it's mad that, like, there is no handbook. And you're just... to make a handbook. Yeah, it's like, are they too hot? Are they too cold? What what sleep attire should they be in? Like, How often just, should you feed them? How yeah, do you know it's, this? It's, yeah. it's literally, like, even just, like, thinking about those things, it, it makes my chest feel a bit funny because you suddenly get those, like, overwhelming first few weeks of being having a newborn and it's so scary and it's also like hoping that you've got that supportive partner as well it does completely change the dynamic at home whether you like to admit it or not it doesn't necessarily have to be a negative we're not sitting here saying that once you have a baby everything's going to go downhill from there on with your partner but I just feel like it is something that needs to be addressed and spoken about and it is okay to feel massively overwhelmed or sad or not happy yeah. and, or and terrified like i remember as well because like theo was in NICU and they are very strict like they have a set routine like they, on this hour they feed then and they change and it was very like regimented by the clock and i felt like i hadn't looked after him for five days i did i didn't have to look after him i didn't have to think about any of that someone else was doing that for me so to then be sent home with this baby, I remember like it was literally like holding the most fragile vase. I was terrified. I was terrified to do anything. I didn't know if I was meant to stick to that routine or whether we find our own routine. Like I remember for like the first two weeks, we literally used to set an alarm and we used to get three hours sleep and then the other person would go up to bed and the other person would tag down. And that's how we lived until we hit a point where we were like, we, we will die if we carry on doing this. Yeah. Um, and it's just terrifying. I remember literally 
I'm sure every new parent does this. How many times in a night do you wake up and check their breathing? Oh, oh my God. It's, and then you're like staring at their chest because you don't want to touch them in case you wake them and you're like... <laughs> it's just, and I mean, I, I'm not going to lie, I still do that now. I'm paranoid. But my mum said to me something like, the worrying never stops. As soon as they're born, she's like, I still worry about you. Yeah, and I so get that. So I get, get that it's never going to go. I mean, talking about like relationships with your partner once you've had a baby, I feel like really it probably changes once you're pregnant. Yeah. Um, even like just the side of things in regards to maybe like sex with your partner, I know for me that especially with Blake and Ivy and that first pregnancy and your body changing and you're not maybe feeling your best or, I mean, you probably, f- I, I, and this is a guess because you're very like fit and active, you probably felt really good. Like I literally felt so gross in myself that it was a bit like oh i can't bear to look at myself why would my partner want me i think there's that awkward stage isn't there where you kind of just look like you've put in a bit of weight and you don't really it's like yeah i didn't show properly for ages and i really struggled with that i carry quite small because i want to look pregnant i wanted to look pregnant like you've eaten yeah i wanted to look pregnant and once I had a bump, I loved it. And I'm very lucky. My first pregnancy, I had a really good pregnancy. Second one, not so much. But first one, I had such a good pregnancy. And I actually really loved being pregnant. Pregnant, I found it really empowering. Um, second time around, I was really, really sick, which is why I thought I was having a girl. I really, though. Yeah. My pregnancies could not have been more different. How funny is that? It just shows that like, all these old wives' tales yeah. are a load of crap. Yeah. But I don't know. I just feel like... I didn't feel sexy, by the way, in any of my pregnancies. Yeah. And also, I feel like some men probably find it quite weird to have sex with you when you're pregnant because they find the whole concept a bit weird. Like, I'm telling you now, if there's any men listening, no offence, no one's got a big enough penis to hit your child's head. <laughs> but yeah, I think they've like got that I'll idea. down a peg <laughs> too, babe. I think they've got this like concept of like, oh my God, like it, it might touch them. Like, no, hun, your willy's not that big. Like, it's humanly impossible. But I get the thought. It's a bit like, Ugh. and then it's like, when you get too pregnant, it's like those awkward positions. Like, you can't be on your back. And then like, so if anyone that still wants to have sex when you are heavily pregnant, I recommend just going on your side and oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really have sex in my second pregnancy, so not going <laughs> to lie. Um, but I think... It's very normal. Obviously, you've got that like six week wait, don't you? Of seeing the doctor after you have your baby that you can't have any like yeah, which is absolutely useless. Don't get me started on that. I really, well, you don't believe in it. I don't believe in it, no. And as someone who, so I'm in my job as a personal trainer who works with postnatal women, we're meant to wait for the six week check, but the six week check is so, in my opinion, shit. It's redundant. Honestly, I had my first check. Oh, you had a C-section. Let me look at your... Nothing. They didn't ask. It was the the least comprehensive thing ever. If you genuinely want to be checked properly, I cannot recommend going to get a mummy MOT enough. Go and Google it. It's a website. There's a whole host of um, women's specialised physios. They will literally do an MOT of your body. Best money you can ever spend. Honestly, do it. Sorry. So what do you believe in regards to like exercising and sex after a baby? Sex, I'm not qualified enough to say. Exercising, honestly, it depends on the individual, it depends on how they're healing from their birth. Things like a C-section are going to take longer because you are healing so many different layers of muscle from the inside out. Even just a normal birth, there is physical trauma, like regardless of mm-hmm. how, it, you know, how it happened, whether you got prolapse or what. It, like, that's what I mean. There's so many different factors that how can it be the same for everyone it doesn't really everyone. make sense so, does it? someone who's had a really simple vaginal birth who didn't tear is going to heal quicker than someone who's had a c-section or someone who had a third degree tear and has prolapse like it's it's like anything everyone is ready at different points you yeah be smart and that's why i'm not just saying it because it's my job it is really important like if you do want to return to exercise get some advice or work with a personal trainer who is experienced in that they're not just gonna I don't know I feel really passionately about that but I also think a lot of women are scared of exercising after birth because of the wolves you know it, yeah no I get that I guess it's also like wanting to find that your old self again and mm. get back into like looking good or... and you do you 
uh, again, call me naive, but post first baby, I remember I was really fit and healthy before. And I remember thinking, wow, this just doesn't ping back. Like you look like you've, you're still pregnant to some degree after you've had a baby and, you know, you change your squishy, like uh, my boobs were humongous. Like I, I breastfed Theo and bloody hell, like honestly, I think I had like some kind of oversupply issue because they were veiny, they were angry boobs. <laughs> like they were, they were <laughs> seeing everywhere. Serious <laughs> anger issues. And they made me feel so un sexy and like, so unattractive i remember when i'd have like just like leakages like so that's crap everywhere i just yeah i felt so unsexy and it is again it's that mum guilt it's like you want to enjoy all your time and like you know your body's amazing it's grown and birthed a human whatever that birth looked like but at the same time you want to feel good in yourself. And there's nothing wrong with that. And they're like, people are just like, you have to embrace your new mum body. Agree. I agree. Our bodies are incredible. But I also believe like you deserve to feel good in your body and confident in your body. Like literally you do. And and I really hope that again, I feel like let's be honest, majority of our listeners are women. But it's that partner of yours to give you that reassurance and to give you that affirmation of like, you still look beautiful. Like, because I never really got that. Yeah, it's it's hindsight, isn't it? When you look back, it's, it's actually the first time I thought about it. And I thought about how things change. And I think perhaps where I wasn't feeling good and I, I didn't get that reassurance. I just kind of got on with it. Yeah. Here's a question for you. This is maybe slightly completely like separate to you know, having a newborn and this, that and the other, this is more down, back to talking relationship wise. What are your beliefs in regards to the dynamic with, obviously, when it's just you and your partner, you're both pretty much number one to each other mm. or should be anyway. What are your thoughts on when children are involved, pecking order of your partner or how it should be or what's right or what's think, wrong? I don't think it's as black and white I think obviously and I th- I think that is perhaps where my ex struggled mm-hmm. I think that's where a lot, a lot of men struggle yeah I, th- I think that in my opinion and again this is going to be controversial I feel like when it's just a man and woman you're both a priority to each other mm-hmm. and then a kid comes along and I think a lot of the time what happens is, is the woman's first priority becomes the baby. Yeah. And I feel like it's a real ego dip. Damaging, yeah. For the man to realise that as you get more children, they're going lower and lower in yeah. the pecking order. Now, some people might be shouting at their phone or however they're watching or listening and being like, no, 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 like we both went down on the pecking order. Like I really think that like my child became more important. But I so I feel like, and maybe this is like a really old fashioned way, but I feel like the man looks after the woman, the woman looks after the baby. But they're just so old. However, I don't agree with this. And now this is where I feel like people are going to really disagree. And to be honest, this is more my new outlook. This isn't what I did. But hear me out. Although in theory, and you're always going to feel this way, that your child should always come first, which I'm not saying they shouldn't, if you do not, to a certain extent, prioritise your partner over your baby, you are more likely to end up with that baby in a two-home family. Hiya. No. Because, because, as we've said before, children grow up and move out if you do not have a good foundation of a partnership to look after your children together and work together to do it, you will grow apart. And that's where I think my ex struggled because I think my world became my children. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I don't want anyone to be listening thinking like, yeah, and what? Like my kids are, should come first because he's a shit because he did this. And like, I feel like there's a fine line. I what I'm trying to say is maybe it should, it's more that it should be on par. Yeah, I don't think rather than like kids first, hu- yeah. husband second, or husband first. 
I think you sometimes need to remember that as hard as it is changing as a person and becoming a mother, sometimes I think that the husband can get left aside. I agree. I, I agree with that. But I also believe that there almost has to be a bit of like a mutual recognition. Parenthood changes you, mothers, fathers. In my opinion, it changes mums more because I think physically, I agree, emotionally, I think, I think in that, because of that, it has a deeper change on the man by his I, woman changes so I agree. much I completely agree I 100% changed so much the own is was my complete entire world I had tunnel vision okay but and I'm not I'm not saying look I'm not sitting here saying I was in a perfect relationship where I nurtured that relationship in this relationship I I do agree that more needs to be put in like you need to almost like not let your husband get left behind or your partner get left behind you need to nurture that relationship as much as the one with your children Mm -hmm. but i also believe it's a partnership yeah like they need to have to be singing from the same song sheet yeah yeah. you know i think as well again i'm speaking purely from my experience as a woman or not necessarily as a woman just in my setup I did most of the mothering and the parenting and the day-to-day nitty-gritty of it. I did every single night feed because I was breastfeeding. I was the exhausted one. I was the, you know, touched out one. Mm -hmm. And it's really important that, you know, what I felt like I was always missing was that recognition for it, that, um, what's the word I'm looking for? like almost just that like understanding and empathy of what I'd gone through as well and you know making that time and again I've mentioned it before like I'm I have absolutely been my worst enemy over the years like I didn't want to leave my child um when Theo was 10 months we went into lockdown and I think again that's very different actually that was one of the best things for our family we had more time together Mm -hmm. I I like lockdown too you know he worked from home he got more time with Theo that was actually like one of the best things that happened to us um we allowed you to sort of stay still and live in the moment rather and ignore it allowed him to see how much I did yeah I think do you know what I think that it's really easy, again, to look back and be like, oh, I should have done this or I should have done that. I just think I now have this like, mentality that if and when I have a baby with someone else, I guess, again, it's still, it always comes back down to that communication. You know, when it's very normal to have, like, say, like, the dad's been on paternity for two weeks and then he goes back to work. And you've had like a really, really shitty day. It's just been one of those typical hard days with your baby. As you said, you're touched out, you're emotional, you're tired. And then they come back and they're complaining about their day at work. And all you're thinking about in your head is, you went to go to the toilet on your own. You've had a fucking hot coffee. Wine to someone who gives a fucking shit. And it's that like, I feel like everyone can probably relate to that. But then sometimes I think to myself, and I know it's very easy to say it now, that I'm not with a newborn and my head's like in a better place. But sometimes I sit there and I think, but they are not to know what we've gone through. And I suppose their feelings and their exhaustions are still valid. Yeah, it's not, oh, but no, you can't be tired because I'm more tired because I've done this. And that is where I will do things differently. Instead of me having a go at him and resenting him for going to work and being in his own space, it would be, I'm really sorry you've had a shitty day. I've not had a great one too. Can we have a card up? And then talk about it. And we never did that. Mm. I think that it's really normal for mums, especially with that tiredness as well. And if you're doing the breastfeeding and you're the, and they're not maybe pulling their weight it's so easy to suddenly feel that there's this like divide between the mum and the dad and have that resentment of yeah. that their life doesn't no, 
my opinion, their life doesn't change as much. Of course it doesn't. Nice but in a way, and I'm not sitting here just saying like, mums, you need to just like, you know, grow a pair and get on with it. But it is not the dad's fault that their life doesn't change as much. I agree. And I feel like I'm just going into my new relationship and a new situation in a very look this may all go out the window i'm gonna go and have another baby I can't wait i'm gonna be a fucking emotional wreck and i'll just be a vile how dare you moan about being fucking tired (laughs) (laughs) but i don't know i just feel like it's hard on both of you for different reasons and it always comes back down to Communicating. Oh, yeah. it, it, do you know what? It's one thing I I don't think either of us did in our relationship. So was communicate about how bloody hard it was. We'd moan about it, but we we didn't sit and talk about it in a way that was actually helpful or productive. Or how can I help this situation? I what like I do to make? Yeah, I feel like it does become a bit of like a one up a competition of like, well, not really because like I did the bottles last time, so why don't you go and do bath or? Do you know what I mean? Instead of really being a team. And I think also I'm now talking like weeks or months further down the line because you might be breastfeeding and feel gross or you might have had like a traumatic birth and C-section recovery. But get trying to get back to being intimate doesn't have to be sex, but just intimate, I think will have such a change in your relationship and I feel like especially when I had Rome there was such a lack of that of again I know it's easier said than done like trying to do date nights but don't, date nights don't have to be going out the house with Rome he was a major cluster feeder like he literally was attached to my boob I kid you not from 6 p.m to like 11 p.m I sat at the dinner table with him attached to my boob he had like chicken in his hair oh, like yeah. Like, so like there was no opportunity to go out but I just think it's trying to remember that you are people without your children and again I never did that I know it's so easy like there may be people listening to this with like a three week old in the sling right now and you're listening to this podcast with your airpods on and you're thinking like but I don't want to be intimate like I feel gross but I just feel like the longer it's left the harder it is to get back i agree and i think if i'm being completely honest i think my relationship started to go downhill after we had leo and after it became more normal and real because we never got that intimacy back we never i never felt like and do you think that would have happened even if you didn't have kids no we were we were always I, I who's to know I, I I just do think kids change every kid, kids have changed me massively kid, kids change everyone but I think the dynamic in my house changed so much like I I can literally pinpoint it to my relationship a hundred percent changed since we had the kids we lacked intimacy we didn't cuddle up like we used to and again I'm not sitting here blaming people it's both parties to blame like neither of us made the effort I don't think and it's actually really sad now I think about it Mm -hmm. and I reflect back that's that was four years it's a long time that's a long time and I remember I'm I'm a very physical person Mm -hmm. and when you're going through all of that you know, and you're not feeling confident in your body. And, you know, at the time I was dealing with my birth trauma and everything else life throws at you. And one of the things that could have potentially saved it was that open communication. But again, when I talk about communication, I don't just mean talking about things. I mean, being heard, being listened to, being validated, working together to resolve a problem yeah um it makes me quite sad to know that something very important to me in a relationship changed and but like, i guess the the point of this episode is for anyone who is new to having kids almost like learn from our lessons like that communication and sitting down and having those very open honest conversations you know like 
I need I need you to tell me that I'm beautiful or to cuddle me or to you know it is that physical connection and we 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 just didn't we didn't have that for so long and I remember sitting talking to one of my um NCT friends and well she I think she was talking about her her and her partner and you know like the first time they'd slept together since the baby and I just couldn't relate but it, mm -hmm. I remember thinking like is this normal is something wrong like he doesn't want to be with me and it's not till now obviously I'm where I am I look back and I think it was the start of everything that's I guess followed and it was probably the start of the breakdown of my marriage which is really sad because really we'd we'd been married a year yeah and I don't want anyone listening thinking like you know there could be people listening that are just pregnant and they haven't started that motherhood journey yet or it's you know scary. people that had a baby six months ago and they haven't yet slept with their partner that's not a red flag like I think it's more we're trying to get out there it is that communication like it, it, I feel like it's all we say it, but it's it so is true. being on the same page it is being heard it is validating each other's feelings it is difficult for a man to adjust adjust to adjust to not only are they becoming a dad but realistically they probably are slightly being put in the shadows yeah they're not what, they're not but what i think what i want to sort of get across which is i something that i wish i did and i will make sure i do is being trying to be more aware of that i agree because i wasn't i only thought i am not sat here saying he should have done this he should have, i completely agree and I've always said it like a marriage and a relationship take two people to it I should have made him probably feel more important and, and I feel like when you become a mum that's the last thing you're going to think of because I do think you just think tunnel vision no but it's just like he's my husband or he's my partner like it's fine we'll be fine but like relationships take work and it's things like this that you know I do sometimes sit back and reflect or when I'm journaling and regardless of the mistakes or the situations that maybe my ex did there are still things that I absolutely could have worked on that I have learned and I will make sure I do but no one is perfect and no I like said like you don't get a, a handbook and I think the the things we're trying to also factor in to like regulating ourselves and being these amazing partners and wives and mother is like we are we're talking about having a baby. We're talking about sleep deprivation. We're talking about, as they get older, managing behaviours, managing emotions, managing day-to-day -day mundane life, managing this, that, the other, trying to juggle everything, trying to juggle your own feelings and trying to be the best version of yourself, the best mother, the best wife, the best partner. It's bloody hard. Yeah. And I think you can only learn from your experience and you can only... you. You can sit here, we can sit here now on the flip side looking back. And yeah, I wish I'd done this. I wish I'd done this. But in my, when I was living it, that's, you know, that's how things yeah, played But out. when I was in it, I didn't think I was no, you didn't. doing anything wrong. I was just taking it a day at a time, being a mum, doing what I could. It's, it's, and I, I, I do believe that at the time I did have a supportive partner who really did his part to you know, be that dad that I needed help with. I think just somewhere along the lines, sometimes people get so caught up in being a mum that they're no longer a partner. And I'm not sitting here saying that you need to make the effort even if he doesn't. I'm just sort of speaking from experience what maybe I would do differently next time. If you're ever feeling a certain way, you're feeling like, you know, they moan a bit quite a lot and you're sort of feeling a bit resentful, rather than taking that resentment out on them, mm -hmm. talk about this. When you said that the other day, it sort of made me feel this way. And yeah, like, just if you've got good communication, just you're going to survive forever. <laughs> just talk about it, hit and listen to each other. Like, it's the biggest thing I have learned over the years it and and I don't want to be again like just constantly talking about bad things but like having kids and and bringing up a, a human that you have made together is the most magical thing like I don't want people sitting here thinking that like 
once you have kids, it just goes downhill from there. Like I just say, like, having kids is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Like honestly, when I think about the best things in my life, it's my children. Yeah, they have changed me, and they have changed me into a better version of myself. They have made me look at life so much differently. They honestly like it's like what I've said at the start like everything I've been through this year they are the re- they are what have got me through it mm-hmm. like just then they are oh I, I honestly like put, so anyone listen to this who's about to have a kid and like oh my gosh what have I done and honestly it's the best thing that will ever ha- it's the hardest thing hardest thing in the world but the best thing that can ever happen to you I genuinely believe that so we thought we'd um, go into a few emails um, before we end the episode. So have you got one for us? Yes. So, hi, I wanted to share my experience with you regarding my stay or leave second chance scenario. It's a bit of a long one. Thank you for taking the time to read. I've been married to my husband for nine years and we have two young children. We have always had a great marriage. My husband is great, really hands on with the kids, very supportive towards me and just generally one of the good guys. We had a very traumatic experience with the birth of our first child and in the early weeks too. Our sex life became less and less and general life parenting challenges took over. We had less and less time together as a couple but still remained strong. When our first child was two, my husband out of the blue admitted to me that he'd recently cheated on on me during a night out. He described it as a drunken mistake, a one night stand that he regretted instantly and was very, very remorseful. He decided to tell me he couldn't live with the guilt and thought I deserved to know. My whole world fell apart. I still loved him but couldn't believe he could do this. It absolutely floored me as it was something I would never expect him to do. I trusted him 100%. To cut a long story short, I decided to stay and he continued to show remorse and rebuild my trust. If I'm honest, it was just brushed under the carpet. We're good at that, aren't we? Uh, especially you. And we never really dealt with it head on. We continued with the same routine as before, still a strong unit, but never really finding the time for each other, just juggling busy life. We went on to have our second child and again had quite a difficult experience during the birth, but everything was great. We had our family unit and were were happy or appeared to be. We still hardly ever had sex or much quality time together and it has become and it has since become apparent that there were underlying issues not being addressed. I was suffering from PTSD from the trauma of our first birth and it has since become apparent that much of this was affecting us both in our relationship. When our second child was about six months old, my husband admitted to me that he had cheated again. Another isolated incident, which he regretted immediately. He told me that he thought he needed some help with his mental health and that he was struggling with a lot of issues which had he had kept hidden. Again, my whole world was shattered. How could he do this again? I loved him so much but could not get over it a second time round. My husband was again very remorseful. I had weeks and months of not knowing what to do, wanting to stay and work through things but thinking that the right thing to do would be to leave as he'd done it for a second time. We continued living together and kept things the same for the kids but I was unsure what my future held. My husband asked for a chance for him to prove to me it could be different this time, said he would seek help, get counselling and work on his issues. Over the next weeks and months, he worked really hard to get to the bottom of where I, why he had done this. He said he loved me, hated himself for what he had done and needed to understand why. His self-esteem was very low. He had experienced thoughts of taking his own life as he felt he would, we would be better without him because of his actions. And he had many counselling sessions, attended various groups and courses and he worked really hard to salvage our marriage and prove to me that he could be trusted and also work on his own issues and mental health. This process is still very much ongoing and I've decided to stay and continue our marriage. We are almost two years on from me finding out about the second incident and I can honestly say we've never been happier. Mm. We've both dealt with and addressed a lot of personal issues. I know a lot of people will think I'm crazy for staying and say he will do the same again. I get it. I would probably think the same. But my husband's actions have shown me and still continue to show me how sorry he is. I now understand what led him to do what he did. Through individual counselling and couples counselling, along with many other things we have worked on together, I think together is key, it became clear that there were issues in our marriage previously that never got dealt with. We never addressed things which led to mistakes being made. I am by no way defending what my husband has done. It's wrong and believe me, I have made him suffer. However, we are stronger than ever now and it feels so different this time. Every day he shows me how hard he is working to keep our marriage strong. There have been days where I've 
where I thought, what the hell am I doing? But he constantly shows me that we have something special and is continually building trust. Listening to your podcast has cemented to me that I'm doing the right thing by staying. It's helped me to confirm that we do have something worth fighting for. And I'm not just staying for the kids. We are happier than ever now and our sex life is great too. It's hard to put into words my story without it sounding like I'm defending his actions, but hopefully this might help someone in a similar situation who feels like there is no way through it. Things can be better and if both parties are willing to work to change and work on things, then it can work out. It doesn't always have to end badly. So... Obviously, you reading that, I wasn't aware of what the end was going to be. But I sort of found myself thinking of things like, and again, I might sound really naive, but like, oh, okay, like he's gone and told her, he's owned it, he's taking responsibility, he's seeking help. You know how I said a few episodes ago, and I feel like it was probably, yet again, quite controversial, but I sort of said like, sometimes I don't think cheating is as black and white as you did the deed, you were wrong. Obviously, she hasn't gone into a lot of detail, but she has explained through therapy individually and together there's been underlying issues that have led to why he did it. That's sort of what I was trying to explain is, and I know you're probably in your head right now thinking, absolutely not, I would never put up with that, goodbye. But sometimes I do think that is a prime example of what I was trying to get across is, Look, the second time round, it shocked me a bit listening to it that he did it again, but they never resolved it from the first time round. So it's like shit will keep on happening until you get to the root of the problem. And it's finding out whether that root of the problem and solving it is worth sticking around. And obviously that is proof, (laughs) please God, may it continue, that sometimes it can still work. I agree. And look, and I know what you're going to say. You've got to be the right type of person. Yeah. You are that person. That's <laughs> I'm like going into your head and not even letting you look, think. But I know what I, you're going to say. So I just to say, like, I have experienced someone close to me who has done the same. And I think the key factor here is he has taken responsibility. He has gone and sought help. But they've worked as a team together. Yeah. And look. I admire this lady because I think it does require you to, you to be a certain person to yeah. be able to not forever bring that up. I I am not that kind of person. And again, like so I'm not here judging like I'm actually I'm re- it's really nice to read a story where there's a positive ending to something like that. I just know as a person I am couldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Again, I've experienced it in my own life where someone close to me has done pretty much the exact same and I can vouch for the fact they're happier and more in love than ever and I th- I think yeah, it's amazing that someone can do that um, but again it's it's what we always come down to it's the communication it's the responsibility it's the teamwork mm-hmm. yeah I'm really pleased that you've managed to to work together and yeah I know it's like it's as you said it's nice to kind of hear a happy ending at the end of that and it shows that sometimes it can work I think in my head I'd want to do what she did and I think it can work but I'm it's like in my head I want to do what she did but I know that I'm like you yeah, but I don't want to be so do you know what I mean yeah. like, I am that person that would bring it up and throw it in their yeah. face I know I know as much as yeah, that does sound desirable. It does sound desirable, but I I don't I don't I, that's I don't have that in me, and I I think that's also okay. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna do some stale leave scenarios now. So yeah, me and Tash offer I can have deferring opinion. Hit me up. Okay. Partner gambling every penny he owns and drink driving. Asshole, but I love him. <laughs> So, I, I mean, I love the bluntness, asshole, but I love him. Hold on, would you read that again? Partner gambling every penny he owns and drink no, living. Asshole, but I love him. No. Sorry. Yeah, I would leave too. Yeah, sorry you love him. <laughs> <laughs> but he's an asshole. You can do better, hon. You can do better. Calls me names. Address it. 
no. dress it and if it doesn't stop then it's not okay like that I would probably leave it depends like how serious the relationship is yeah like if you're like 10 years in with kids and stuff he's like oi bitch I'd be like hun like not okay can you call me something it's just respect isn't it yeah that's uh, communicate and it needs to change if it doesn't then there's probably a lack of respect somewhere yeah I agree I love him but he just doesn't support me invest in us how I need I think supporting your partner is really big for me it's massive to have someone who supports you and like it's, she says like invest in us how I need I feel like that means like you're not on the same page well yeah like her need, if her, if your needs aren't met in a relationship and you don't have the support well, then it's not really a relationship is it unfortunately I'm going to have to say leave yeah I would leave too have two kids won't live with us stays with his mum literally won't commit we've been together 13 years she trying to make it work for the kids or leave it's like he wants the best of both worlds no I'm sorry but you have kids together he's been together 13 years and if he doesn't live with you that's that is the biggest red flag I would leave much as possible away and I'm really sorry I have a hundred times better yeah you're you're pretty much already doing the single mum life Please. Yeah, so I would say leave. Okay, so we are going to end this episode with another affirmation, and we we hope you're enjoying these, and we hope you're actually like saying them. So yeah, I'd like you to repeat these. Yeah, and definitely. I feel like we need to make one relevant to this episode. So I'm thinking something like, "I'm a good mom. I'm doing my best, and that is enough." I love that. Repeat it. I'm saying that to you. <laughs> I am a good mum. Mm-hmm. I am doing my best, and that is enough. Amen. Amen. Sister. Say that to yourselves, guys. Thank you so much for listening, and we will catch you next week. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube. Go and follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Also, make sure you're following our Instagram page and share. Honestly, we cannot explain the power of you sharing what we're doing. We're trying to get the message out there. Send it to your friends on WhatsApp. Send it. Put it in your Instagram stories. Everything. Just try and help us grow and reach the right people. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.